Even the most faithful horror movie fans wouldn't want to witness the scenes we're talking about today. A promising MMA fighter, Jared Wyatt, went down in sports history for murdering his sparring partner in cold blood. I don't often give additional listener discretion warnings before telling you about a story, because the name of the podcast should be a strong hint that it can get graphic in detail. But consider this your warning. Under the influence of psychedelic mushroom tea, Jared Wyatt ripped the still-beating heart from Taylor Powell's chest. And that's just where the gruesome details begin. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe, I'm the host, and thank you for joining today. And hey, look, I'm back in my actual studio. Well, you, you can't actually look, but look. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to listening to this podcast, and this is the first episode you've stumbled upon, and have no idea what I'm talking about, last week I was on a work trip and did the episodes for my hotel room, and your boy was on Struggle Street. It's not as easy peasy as I thought it would be. I thought I would just set up my recording equipment and boom, there you go. No. On top of the outside noise, I didn't expect the whole vibe to be off. And I should have expected it, though. I had done all the previous 260-something episodes sitting in the same seats in the same room of my house. So I managed to get rid of most of the background noise from the hotel room shows, but I can't fix the vibes. Sorry about that. Before we get going with your story today, this is your reminder to subscribe where you like to listen to podcasts, perhaps where you're listening now, and connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode, as well as at 10minutemurder.com. Now, to the story. The residents of Klamath County, California even in their darkest nightmares, could not have guessed that on March 21st, 2010, an unimaginable crime would take place near their homes. When Jared Wyatt and Taylor Powell, two young guys dreaming of a career in the MMA, which is mixed martial arts, decided to have a party with their friends, Justin Davis and Billy Joe Bailey, who's Wyatt's ex-girlfriend, they certainly didn't know what was going to happen. And there's a lot to unpack here, and what took place by the time the police officers arrived is only fully known to the four friends, who were also tripping on psychedelic mushrooms. The only statements on which we can build today's story are a little bit clouded. So let's begin with the investigator's story. What police officers saw that day will probably never stop haunting them in their sleep. Sergeant Elwood Lee was dispatched to a Northern California home in Requa, after somebody reported a stabbing. Immediately after entering the house, he noticed dried blood stains on some of the cabinets. Broken glass on the floor crunched under his boots as he walked around. The walls were beat up with holes in the drywall. As he continued to look around, he heard someone mumbling in the living room. When he looked in that direction, he caught sight of a foot sticking out of a couch. On alert, he saw movement from inside that room and then heard more mumbling that he couldn't quite make out still. Sergeant Lee's body tensed and his hair stood on end. He saw a body on that couch, an eyeball on the floor, and a big naked man on the floor covered from head to toe in blood. His eyes were gleaming fiercely as he looked up at Sergeant Lee. It was Jared Wyatt, and he mumbled, I killed him. Sergeant Lee quickly put handcuffs on him and I'm sure feeling a relief that the person capable of this mess was restrained. At that point, he wasn't even aware fully of the gravity of the situation that he was dealing with. Another glance at the victim on the couch is a moment in time that I'm sure he still sees in his mind. Taylor Powell was unrecognizable because he lacked most of the skin that should have been on his face. Sergeant Lee looked down and noticed an 18-inch incision The most disturbing part about the gaping wound in Taylor's chest is what you couldn't see. His heart was missing. At one point, Jared asked the police officers if they were God, or if they were God coming to save him. Billy Joe Bailey, Jared's ex, and Justin Davis were arrested on the scene as well. Justin later testified that he left the house to go to Crescent City. Jared wanted him to stay and even jumped on Justin's car to try to keep him there. According to Justin's testimony, he later came back to the house to get his dog. 
he caught glimpses of someone straddling another person in the living room and talking about cutting off a tattoo. That's when he backed out and called the police. Jared was trying to convince Sergeant Lee that it was Taylor who started this supernatural battle, telling him that the world was coming to an end. Taylor put Jared in a chokehold from behind, making him feel like he couldn't get up. Jared justified what he did next by saying, quote, Satan was in that dude. Jared admitted to cutting out Taylor's tongue and removing his heart. He was concerned that Taylor was still alive and it was a bad omen, meaning that the fight wasn't over yet. So he threw the ripped out body parts into the wood burning stove heater. Cooking or burning these organs in his mind would prevent the possibility of the devil coming back to life. Okay, so some sources also say that there was a thing going on between Jared and his ex, and it's possible that Taylor was hitting on Bailey, and Jared simply overreacted, which came as no surprise because he was known as an aggressive and impulsive person in his environment. Now let's get to Bailey's story. She witnessed some of the events preceding the slaughter, which might shed some light on what happened. It all started at a bar in Crescent City. Bailey met her ex-boyfriend, Jared, there. Soon, they decided to relocate to the Requa house, where they were joined by Taylor and Justin. Bailey testified that in the past, she had met Taylor only three times, and she had never met Davis before. Everyone was in a good mood, as the three men were preparing mushroom tea, and they all tried it. Justin teased Bailey to drink the tea or she'd be the only sober one there, so she gave in and drank some too. The three male mushroom musketeers went outside, but not long later, Jared came back in, complaining that his eyes were burning. Justin was frantically trying to leave the house, but Jared didn't want him to. He started yelling at Taylor to get him his guitar. At this point, Taylor's whole vibe changed. He screamed and repeated three times in a different voice, You want to effing die. Apparently, this was the trigger. Jared and Taylor started wrestling on the kitchen floor. Bailey had a hard time putting the events in chronological order as well, but she had a distant recollection of Taylor spitting at Jared or Taylor posing a threat to her. She left the room and hid in the bedroom. According to Jared's defense, he was trying to defend Bailey. However, taking into account the act of mutilating the body and taking the time in removal of the victim's face indicated callous indifference. For the prosecutors who have witnessed cases of involuntary manslaughter in their careers, Jared Wyatt's actions, like the time-consuming and complicated act of removing the heart, tongue, and skin, proved intent. Jared was trying to put the blame on the mushrooms, or insanity, but it was a story that no one was buying. This particular psychedelic substance basically doesn't really work that way. If it catalyzed the unspeakable anger and brutality or psychosis in this man, it must have already been there to begin with. Del Norte County District Attorney John Alexander said, quote, I wanted him to admit this wasn't the product of drug delusion. It was always absolutely non-negotiable that Wyatt would have to admit to first-degree murder, that he admit that he had committed this brutal murder without hiding behind the veil of drugs. It is sad that we have taken this long to get to this day, but I think justice was delivered. As I mentioned before, Jared pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. However, multiple psychiatric examinations revealed that Jared was perfectly fine and didn't have any mental disorder. He was ruled competent to stand trial. During the trial, then 29-year-old Jared didn't testify and didn't want his family to testify either. His attorney admitted, we looked for an agreement that would at least give him the opportunity to be paroled someday. James Fallman said, as bad as 47 years to life sounds, it's better than life without the possibility of parole. Finally, he ended up with a deal, pleading guilty to first-degree murder involving mayhem. He was sentenced to two life sentences of 25 years to life. Jared Wyatt will not be eligible to see a parole board until he is in his 70s. This epic fighting game ended with a double KO, as Jared will waste his entire life in prison. Instead of winning MMA titles, he will be remembered as a cruel murderer who redefined the word gruesome. Judge William Follett in Del Norte County Superior Court said, The murders I see are so often senseless but the brutality and horror involved in this case exceed all of the bounds I have seen. He continued, The depths of grief imposed upon the victim's family are depths I pray no one else will suffer. Nothing we do today will bring back this young man. <laughs> 